everyone. Welcome to the Nakia Phoenix podcast. I'm Nakia, your host, your guide, and your fellow traveler along this journey. I know it's been a couple years since we were last here right now, and I'm so thankful to be here with my friend, Joe. Hello, Joe. <laughs> so we had an entire ass pandemic, like... You sure yes did. <laughs> So we took some time off to reset, to regroup. And right before the pandemic hit, you and I had been meeting up, having conversations like, ooh, girl, we got to do something. We got to switch up the narrative. We got to tell our stories. We need to empower women. And then, you know, global pandemic happened. Yes. And we were kind of... Actually, at mm -hmm. the end of the day. Yeah. And really to truly find what our story was. Mm -hmm. and, here it is. and here it is. So how did we first meet? Hold on. <laughs> um, our puzzle. That's right. That's right. Yep. We were in uh, Miami. <laughs> at a very random impromptu New Year's Eve party at my house. <laughs> That's true. We did that. We did that as well. That was, oh man. And it was mom, who is now your mom as well. And um, we were voguing in a whole, it was. <laughs> it was like instant. It was like, okay, this is my, this is my girl. This is my person. This is my family. Yep. Vibing on the same wavelength. It was like, yep, I got it. And then come to find out, like, both models, like, we're damn near the same height. Yes. There's so yes. many similarities between us. Yes. And a whole lot of hot messes <laughs> behind closed doors. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's true. <laughs> we're both very strong, beautiful, vocal women. Um, but in like the time that we've gotten to know each other, we realized that we've shared something else in common with each other. And that's why we're here right now. So let's get into it. Let's talk about it. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And this is something that hits home for both of us because I don't know. I don't really know what's the best way to, because someone's criticized me before about the way that I've described this, um, whether it's you're a victim or you're a survivor, but even saying survivor has like this kind of, you know, negative undertone. So it's like, how do you, how do you describe yourself? Um, right now I'm just in it, <laughs> to be honest with you. I, I feel in, right in between both of them, the, um, the victim, because I am just barely a year out of my situation, but I'm also surviving every single day through the trauma, through the anxiety, through the depression. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm in it. <laughs> I hear you. Um, and I think that um, even though I know that I've spoken about it in like little bits and pieces, I remember being at a wellness event some years ago and the moderator for the panel asked us, um, when was a moment that we felt most the most proud of ourselves? And as we're sharing our stories, I was like, okay, well, I need to dig deeper because there's someone, there's someone here that needs to hear what I have to say. And I need to hear what I have to say because it wasn't something that I was used to vocalizing. And the moment that I shared was a moment that I decided to get a restraining order against an abusive ex. And mm -hmm. It took so much for me to get to that point. And I know that we've, we, you know, talk about this a lot where it's like, as women, 
as these women that are, you know, on the outside, have it all together. I mean, we're doing things, we're in magazines, runways, commercials, all this stuff. Like, you know, you see us, <laughs> right? You see us yeah. out and we just, well, you, <laughs> you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but on the inside, there's a part of us that's suffering. There's a part of us that's quiet. There's a part of us that's really hurting. And we don't, we did not know how to help her. So in that moment that I shared from the panel discussion, where I was talking about what I was proud of, I was proud of myself for finally taking the first step to stand up for that woman that needs that love, that needs someone to be her champion. Yeah, and that's probably one of the, the most difficult steps and a lot of women don't even take, which is the going and making the restraining order. Because we have that self-guilt and society always tells us, you know, shh, things we don't say out loud, we just brush it under the rug. Yeah, so that was definitely a good moment there so that people can have that strength to go out and do that for themselves. Right. Because like you said, it's not easy. We're carrying so much. We're carrying so much weight. We're carrying other people's weight, which is crazy. Right. Yeah. Like, but we're not, we haven't been given permission to talk about our own struggles, specifically when it comes to domestic violence and domestic abuse it's like it's there's this this shame the stick the stigma that comes along with that like i can definitely remember when i tried because when it's when you're in the midst of it when it's happening to you you know that something's wrong you know something's not right but yeah. it's like how do you reach out for help how do you, like, you drop little hints to, like, you know, your loved ones, but then you're also embarrassed because this thing is happening to you when, you know, you're the poster girl for, like, I got it all together. Yeah, that was definitely something that I dealt with for a very long time. And one of the reasons why it took me so long to get out of my situation is because I never saw myself as being weak. And so I was just trying to hold it together, though, in actuality, behind closed doors, I was in pieces. Yeah. So it's like, how do I lower my guard to tell someone, I don't have it. I don't, I don't have it together. This is happening to me. Right. To me, out of people. The tall, the loud, the charismatic one, like you said, the poster girl, the, the one that everyone always seems to see as being so happy that this is actually happening to her. It's like, it was a reality that I didn't even want to be, to be real. And I knew that if I spoke it out loud, it would be. Right. It was definitely terrifying. And of course, you if you have a partner that is completely and utterly manipulating at you at all times, you even start to question all that, oh, all that reality. Absolutely. I mean, how many times... <laughs> How many times did you have to check yourself, like in the midst of an argument, in the midst of an incident? How many times did you have to check yourself to say like, wait, is this really happening? Consistently. I would always talk to myself and even to my partner at the time, I'm like, this isn't real life. This isn't how things go. And they would just continuously tell me that it was my fault just switch the script on me continuously. It's just like, it, it was insane. I, I really felt like I was going insane between knowing what you know is right from wrong and then what you have in front of you and what your manipulator and your abuser is telling you. Right. Yeah. That, I literally had to start recording conversations that I would have with my abuser because obviously immediately after the argument, he would try to say, oh, I never said that. 
oh no, that didn't happen. You're mistaken. Why would I ever? And then he would also throw in the, why would I ever hurt you like that when I love you so much? Yes, yes. The consistent amount of love bombing and gaslighting. Which these are words that I came to find out about later on after leaving my situation. That I had no idea that those are the things that were being done to me. The gaslighting and the love bombing. It's, yeah, it, it definitely throws you into a Yeah. So what... Gracious, this is, yeah, this is, um, this is something that we, you know, when we started talking about, like, why are we doing this? What's our why? Like, I remember thinking, like, is it okay to tell our story? Is it okay to share, you know, like, these, these details and to be this open about what we've experienced. And yeah, me, it was a no brainer. Once I got out of my situation and I was able to step back and look, cause it's different when you're in it. When you're in it, you're in survival mode. You don't even know survival mode. When you get out of it, it's a whole different like world. Then you're just looking inward and saying, wow, I would never want any other person to suffer and to go through what I went through. And unfortunately, I went through it with a child. Mm -hmm. My child, who now is 12 years old, the most amazing person that I know, <laughs> um, went through it with me as well. Mm -hmm. And just looking on the aftermath of how it's affected me personally and my daughter, I just said that this, I cannot allow for anyone else to go through this. I want people to know that this could be the face of domestic violence, so can my daughter, so can yours, so can your neighbor, so can your sister, your brother. It's just bringing awareness to this is so big. And the crazy thing about it is finding out how many other peers of yours have actually gone through it. Right. I mean, we would have never thought that this would have been something that we had a chain linked to each other, you know, yes. that we have all the bonds in a way. And it's, it's incredible. It's sad. And I feel only by being vocal can we bring awareness, maybe hopefully preventing someone or maybe just, I don't know, giving that person that boost to say, hey, look at that. She got out of her situation. She was in there for X amount of years and still was able to come out and triumph. That there is the end of the tunnel. Right. Yeah. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um when I started opening up to people, um, especially the friends that I had, um, that this was happening to me, that I was experiencing abuse, even after I got out of the relationship, there were so many people that didn't believe me. And part of it was that my, my abuser had done a really fantastic job of convincing other people that I was the problem. And so when I reached out for help or when people would ask me, like, you've been in my A for a little bit, like, why? I'm like, well, here's why. And then also, please don't tell my abuser that you saw me, that you talked to me. Don't, don't tell them anything about me because it's just going to trigger you know, them to try to reach out to me even after like having, you know, a restraining order. Um, it's, but it's just so many, so many people didn't believe me. And I realized that in order for me to protect myself and set these boundaries and really stand, stand strong in my boundaries, I might have to cut some people off. Like, if you, if you don't believe me, if you're not listening to me, if you don't have empathy for me, compassion for me, then I don't need you in my life. Yeah, but unfortunately, it's a stigma that, like, follows women. Usually, if something like this happens, because the same thing happened to me. 
Um, nobody believed me though. I had photographed it, photographic evidence, um, video. Um, it becomes a, what did you do? Right. Right. What did you make, make him do that? Oh, it must've been because you're this way. And I actually have a quote from a book that I was reading. It's called, it says, toxic people condition you to believe that the problem isn't the abuse itself, but instead your reaction to their abuse. It's just like, <laughs> yeah. okay. Because there, there are a few. <laughs> there, it's not the I'm reacting to the abuse. And it's like, yeah, that's they will call you. The abuser would say, "Oh, she's just she's jealous, or she's this, or she's that." But no one ever questions why is she this way. Right. <laughs> no, what did you do to make him abuse you? Why do we still live in a world that those are still questions? Right. I've come up with every proof in the world. Well, I never saw it. I never saw him abuse you. I'm abusing. And you're like, the, you know, when I think about, because October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, it's important to talk about what abuse looks like. Because we've always been taught that, you know, abuse is violence, right? We've seen, we've seen all of the movies where a partner is getting beat up, where, you know, a partner is, oh gosh, you know, they're being stalked. But we, I know for myself, I didn't, I didn't know what abuse looked like outside of the violence outside of the yeah. stalking that it's, it can be someone who's controlling. It can be someone who, you know, is they're gaslighting you. They're manipulating you. Um, we have this, our, our former partners would start arguments with us before we had to go to jobs. Yeah jobs where we're showing up to be the face of something, to be the model, to be the actress. And they're sabotaging us right before and breaking our confidence right before we have to get up and do the thing that we've been hired to do. And that we love to do. I mean, I've, I can't tell you the amount of gigs that I have lost or just even corporate jobs that I worked at. It's just like completely sabotaging me and just shredding me to pieces before leaving mm -hmm. as if that brought satisfaction. Um, but I later found out that it's because they didn't want me to shine in right. a way, you know, they wanted that to have full control over my every step, everything that I did. Full control. Yeah. By Oh, great. Yeah. It's it's incredible, like we were saying about the different uh, forms of abuse. Like we have emotional abuse, financial abuse, physical abuse, digital mm -hmm. abuse. I mean, it, it 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 just it keeps going on outside of the physical, the mental, and the emotional abuse. Those are the ones that linger on. Right. Those are the things that I can be honest and say I still have nightmares that my ex is holding me hostage. And even though I've been working through this for years, it's still there. It still comes up every now and then. And my, the voice of my saboteur, the voice of my inner saboteur, oftentimes is his voice telling me that I can't do something, telling me that, you know, I'm ugly. Why would I think that anyone would ever listen to me? Why, you know? And I have to check myself. That's not me. That's, that's his voice. That's I think I remember or like a few months ago that that's how I was, that I, that's how I've been feeling. Um, it was, I felt like he was a ghost that lived, that lives. Cause I, I, you know, I'm, I'm freshly out of mind. I can't say that I'm, I'm getting there. Remember I'm mm -hmm. getting there, but he lives in with me. Um, it is. It's like my, my subconscious is not my voice, it's right. his voice. The constant 
just constantly speaking ill of me from the moment that I opened my eyes until I fell yeah. asleep. Yeah. So it, it's, it's so true. It's crazy how we live with that and, and showing the difference in between, you know, my situation being fresh and then yours being a few years ago on how impactful they are. Because think about how many, how many times that you wanted to go for something, but you stopped yourself because you were still hearing his voice saying, you can't do this. Who do you think you are? Or, I mean, I, as of recently, <laughs> actually I had to do, I had to do a gig um, and it was literally felt like, you know, those, those paralyzing demons, you know, the things when you sleep and you feel like you're, you're paralyzed. That like, I could not move out of the bed and my bed was literally a sinkhole. And it was thoughts of all the words that was consistently told to me by my abuser. And it's, it's difficult in a way as like a strong person, you're like, no, I can get this. And then then the self-sabotaging starts happening again. It's like, why are you allowing this to happen? Come on, you can do it. You can get out of it. But it's it, it's incredible how it takes a hold of you and how fragile the mind is. I've come to find out within these last few years, and especially now on the you know other side of it, on how fragile the mind is. Absolutely. Like, it's one... And... They know it going into it. They know it. They know that there's this, there's this part of us that's going to hold on to, to the abuse, hold on to the negativity, hold on to, you know, the hurt and it's going to echo. They know that. And I honestly think that they still, they get a thrill off of that. It's like a dopamine rush for them to know that, they're doing something that's going to have an impact on us even years afterwards. So, yeah, it's incredible. I mean, I went into my relationship with my abuser being that he was my Prince Charming that was going to sweep me off of my feet. <laughs> it's all seemed so poetic and so beautiful. Single mom, you know, freshly getting out of a relationship you know, in your early 20s. And, you know, those relationships are always mm -hmm. a little rocky. And it was, it was great. It was beautiful sunshines. And it was a slow progression of right. the manipulation, slow progression to the point that I had lost myself completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, it, especially when it's that gradual. And you know, because your your relationship was for a while as well. It's that gradual one. It, I, honestly, I think that, I mean, personally for me, that was the worst. Because obviously, you know, when you look at, and I'm going to, throughout this conversation and throughout this podcast, we're going to be using terms that people may not agree with, but we're telling our own personal stories. So it is what it is, right? If there was no way at the beginning that either one of us knew the monster that was hiding underneath the sheets. Exactly. We didn't know. Because believe me, we've gotten those, the red flags that progressed later on in the years in the beginning, I would have jumped ship a long Ex time ago. Exactly. You mean, what have to be going through what I'm going through currently with my daughter? Oh, no. Like... I remember, and I'm sure I'm sure you have something similar. Getting ready to go go somewhere, and my abuser saying, "Well, are you sure you're gonna wear that?" And then it turns into nitpicking everything about you, and then eventually, yeah, you stop being yourself. You stop shining the way that you used to shine. 100%. I mean, mine was particular in the fact of my high heels. I have always been a very confidently tall woman. <laughs> like the, the better, the closer the guy. Yes. <laughs> Love me for me. 
And I love me some red lips. I mean, I love, you know, I love it. And I remember um, my abuser telling me, why are heels? Heels are so outdated. They're so this and so that. I mean, of course, it was poking into his insecurities of his height. But he actually made me get rid of all of my high heels. All of them. I did not have hair high. I didn't wear heels for the first three to four years of our relationship. Um, also, I was not allowed to wear red lipstick or red underwear because that was a horse color. Oh, my. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and it was everything that I wore. It was, you're so cheap. Look how cheap you are. What are you wearing? Zara, H&M. You're so... You're such you're so poor in the way that you dress, or you're ghetto, or you look like a typical um, ghetto Spanish girl. I mean, it was everything that he could possibly do, which is insane because this is what he it, had initially that, <laughs> fell in love. That. So, it was never this, but I think, and I was speaking to my mom about this um, a little while ago. I remember there was this thing, which was one of the very first flags, first red flag that I didn't catch on to. He told me, I'm going to burst that bubble. He's like, you just are so confident. One day I'm going to burst that bubble. And in my head, I was thinking, oh, he must think I just have a big head, blah, 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 blah. No, it was right there. He wanted to break me down. And he told me, and it's just like, since I never experienced anyone that evil, and like you said, we'll use terms that may not everyone may agree with, that evil with evil intent that I didn't think twice. Mm -hmm. I try to push my butt. Good well, luck. There are, <laughs> to be real, right? There are a number of men of color who will, you know, they'll call you big head, like, oh, you think you're too cute. And it's, at first it seems like they're just, you know, poking a little fun, but behind yeah. behind those words, there's, there's some animosity. Behind those words, there's some truth coming from them. They actually mean it. So. Yeah. And it's been incredible incredibly insane to find these people like like where did you guys come from listen <laughs> at being dating for the past god knows how long oh there are a lot of whew, there are so many of them out there oh my goodness I, <laughs> and and yeah. you start to think like wait what am i doing to attract this <laughs> what am i yeah it is like we use, because I, I will say undoubtedly that my abuser is a narcissist, but we use that word socially, like just so lightly. Oh, that person is always looking in the mirror. They always care about, oh, they're a narcissist. No, the, this is an it's, actual yes. disorder. Yes. Yes. It really And it is so real how people that have this are completely have absolutely no empathy none, for others none because when you when you have told me the things that your abuser is still trying to get away with i'm like it's never going to click it's never going to click for him for my abuser it didn't i i literally after i had the restraining order and then let the restraining order run out. Cause I was like, surely it's been X amount of years. Surely he has learned by now, like, don't talk to me, don't contact me. Like we're healing and moving on. But no, because he's a narcissist, it, he was like, oh, I mean, time's up. So I can, I can start hitting, hitting her up again. I know it's, it's, I, I mean, I, I've gone to the point at this, at this point in my life where I, um, I carry my restraining order with me wherever I go. And it's the type of lifestyle that I never thought I would have to have. You're always tense. You're always, I mean, I, 
I'm always checking at the red light who's sitting next to me. Um, I mean, my daughter, from what I told you, she she gets triggers when she sees the kind of car that he used to drive or that drive just because she's just so afraid that right. he will come right to us. I, yeah, it, it's, it, it's, we got it. Yeah. It's deep, it's deep, but the, one of the goals for this podcast, for this, these conversations is reclaiming our power, reclaiming our voice, reclaiming our, our own security, because I don't want to look over my shoulder. I don't look over my shoulder right now because we don't, we're not in the same, we're not in the same place, but every now and then someone will bring up who doesn't know in detail because I'm not going to share every detail, but they don't know what happened and they'll, you know, bring him up. Oh, I saw so-and-so it. And I'm just like, well, it's a good thing. I don't go to that place anymore. You know? Um, yeah. But I don't want I don't want to be tense. I don't want to be looking over my shoulder. I don't want to be quiet anymore about what I experienced. Because what I experienced, I mean, this is why I go so hard on self-love. This is why I talk so much about anxiety and depression and like finding finding your light. Because I had to find my light again. My light had dimmed so much from being in that relationship. And that's exactly what he wanted. He wanted to dim my light. Yeah, it, it's incredible how that happens. I, I remember a few years ago when you were having self-love sessions um, and you had no idea that I was going through what I was going through. And I just remember there was a, um, and I was bringing this up, the mirror yeah. with the, notes um looking into the mirror and writing on a post-it note what you see in your reflection and i remember at that time that it was all these negative terrible things that i and then we went around the room and all the ladies that were that participated they saw what they they told me what they saw in me when they saw me and it was just like it, those people didn't relate. But and then I think that was like what, 2018? 2019. Yeah. And then what me now a few months out of my situation, we do another practice, which is Joe, oh, I want yeah. you to write yourself. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. Um try not to cry because <laughs> I already feel like all the little hairs in my body. Because it was something I was always getting negativity, negativity, negativity. And I know that you felt that energy in me and you told me, you gave me a little project and you said, Joe, I want you to sit down and write yourself love letters. And probably one, the most difficult thing that I've ever had to do is to tell mm. myself that I love And to show my the love that I hadn't gotten from my partner and that I didn't believe yeah. that I had, period. Then I know. And it became this. Awesome. <laughs> and it became this. <laughs> Even just because the first, and the first line that you have in this, um, oh my gosh. Let me let me just press pause and like take a deep breath because yeah, I am I am tearing up. I'm so thankful that for the spring issue, the very first issue of the journal. Um, the Nikia Phoenix Lifestyle Journal <laughs> that you wrote and shared this love letter to yourself. And you start off by saying, let me start off by saying that I love you. It's something that I don't say often to myself. It's almost hard to hear after so many years of putting yourself last. Baby girl, you are amazing and you have accomplished so much for others, but it's time for you to do it for yourself. And I believe in you. Oh, girl. I know it, it was, it was difficult. I just, I, you know, those things remind me of, um, you were a big inspiration for me for quite some time because you would always, you always do, you know, you're, 
affirmations and I would put them in my phone. I would put reminder affirmations in my phone. And I remember my mother looking at my reminders pop up on my phone of my affirmations. And he's like, are you that pathetic that you have to remind yourself to be good? <laughs> um, he's like, you are so incredibly pathetic. You're telling yourself, you go, girl, you got this. And I told him, I was like, well, when you have someone consistently tell you, you don't. Maybe I just need to remind myself. Yeah, so. <laughs> remind yourself of your truth because that is your truth. That is your truth. Yeah. Oh, we have, we have so much to reclaim, so much to build, so much to regain from these past experiences. And I'm hoping First and foremost, that this, these conversations, how we open up to each other will be healing for us. And I'm hoping that it'll also be healing for others because we've got, we got some episodes planned. We've got some things to talk about, but this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? This is just, hey, we're here. We're here. We're still here. And I mean, look at us. Look at you, girl. Thriving and reclaiming. Here, and I almost thought I would not be here. And so, so incredibly thankful to you, the community here, family that has really got me through. Because honestly, I didn't yeah. think that I could physically. But you're be here. here. You're here, girl. And you are, who oh, when yeah. I, you are, you are a lioness. Everything about you is like big and bold and you gonna hear me, you gonna see me. So I am so thankful. I'm so thankful that you're sharing. I'm so thankful that you're opening up. And you've been, I mean, as soon as you were like other, other people, other women need to know, other women need to see, I'm not gonna be quiet anymore. You have been throat chakra open, like ha, ah, heart chakra open, like I'm gonna have this courage for myself. Like you, whoo. Yeah, like I said, I could not, something inside of me and maybe I always say like, I think God put me on this path and maybe he, put me through this journey and this lesson so that I can be that person. You know, you don't, he doesn't put anything on your plate that you can't handle, you know? So I'm thinking this is, this is probably my path as, yeah. as of right now, you know, I to be here to empower women. I want to be here as a voice, um, volunteer, get whatever I possibly can. Cause what happened to me is unfortunate but I've seen other cases that are much worse. Um, and if whatever that we can do together and with people within the community can help the prevention and the awareness, I mean, yeah, we got to use our, our voices. I was told so many, for so many years, the very key quote Oof. was, put your head down. Uh-uh. No, nope, not, not anymore. Not anymore. Ooh, girl. Okay, I have, there are a few things that we, that we definitely want to share um, to help others. Um, one of the things is an abusive relationship checklist, right? Because we were talking earlier about, you know, the red flags and just like the little ways that these things kind of start to creep in and you don't realize until you're trying to get out of it that you were actually in it. Um, and I know when I was sitting in the courthouse waiting to get my temporary restraining order, there was a checklist on the wall. And because before that I was in denial, I was like, something's not right. I need to protect myself, but yeah. I, I'm still not sure why I need to protect myself. So there was a checklist on the wall and it was like, 
are you or have you been in an abusive relationship? And some of the things that it said, you know, has your partner hit you, beat you, or strangled you in the past? Is your partner possessive? Uh, do they check up on you constantly, wondering where you are, who you're talking to? Do they get mad at you for hanging out with certain people, but you don't know why? Uh, is your partner jealous? Even just a teeny bit, you know, are they jealous? Um, do they accuse you of being unfaithful? Are they paranoid? Do they try to isolate you from your family and your friends and your loved ones? Um, does your partner put you down? Do they attack your intelligence, your mental health? Um, do they blame you for their violent outbursts? and tell you that no one's gonna want you if you try to leave them? Do they threaten you or your family? Um, does your partner sexually abuse you? Do they ever push or shove or hit you? Um, do, do they withhold money from you? Do they withhold sex from you? Do they withhold affection from you? I have all those check marks, <laughs> every single one, not one was missed at least. And when I thing. saw this checklist and realized that I was able to like part of me sunk, but also there was a part of me that's even now as I'm talking about it, like sticking your chest out and pushing, rolling your shoulders back, head held high, like you recognize that you were not okay and you're doing something about it. So we want to continue to help others. This is actually a, thing, a tip that you gave me. You have to learn to forgive yourself. Yeah. for the things that happened while you were in there. But it's definitely hard, like, as I'm hearing the checklist and knowing that you are part of this a club mm -hmm. that no one really ever really wants to be of. And for me, it's just, I don't know, it makes me feel so vulnerable. So vulnerable. So, so much pain that someone could actually have the guts and the audacity to do that to you, especially someone right. that claims to love you. And you look at that and you go, wow, what I thought was it love was not. Was not. It was not, because that's not. Uh, I've been very strong about this whole self-love thing as well, because Mm -hmm. I need to reclaim that for myself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, oof. <sighs> this has been therapeutic. This. Yeah. It always, is. I mean, I, I've gotten, you know, you know how family is, older generations of, shh, this, no, we don't talk about this. It's things that you keep behind closed doors, but no. It's therapy every time that I speak it out loud. Um, And I hope that just awareness for anyone. I, I've got, since I made my story public, I can't tell you how many women have come up to me just whispering. It happened to me too. Mm. Yeah. yeah, the club that no one ever wanted to be a part of, but here we are. I right. did not want right. to sign up for this one. <laughs> like, we're in it. We're in it. We're resilient. We're strong, intelligent women. And we have each other and we yes. have resources. I know. There have been a lot of um, women's shelters 
and hotlines that had definitely helped me, especially in the beginning, therapy, spiritual guide. <laughs> um, also, um, church, religious yeah. so pops as well. What are, what are a couple of resources that we can share with people right now? Um, I definitely would, first and foremost, is if something does happen to you like this, is to go ahead and make a police report. I know it's difficult. Um, and even if it takes you a little bit of time, it's, 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 that's typical. Go ahead and make your police report. Go with someone that you know that supports you. You know, going alone is, is difficult. Um, order. Um, but there are hotlines that you can call. We have the National Domestic hotline and then the suicide prevention hotline. Um, I'm in Atlanta, so <laughs> there is Safe Haven, which is really, really great in Nia's place. And throughout the other episodes, and I will, I'll go ahead and um, mention some other ones, but they have been amazing. Because of COVID, um, there's a lot of Zoom outreaches that you could do. You can actually mm -hmm. physically go into these centers of late because I'm not at that point and I, I hope to be there in a few years where I could physically help these women that are still going through it because I'm still in my healing stage and it, it could be triggering. I do um, go and volunteer at a few places. So yeah, just a little And bit then obviously um, <laughs> I hope that this goes without saying, but you know, anyone who's listening or um, anyone who's in need and you feel like you have no way out, there's also the suicide prevention hotline. So. Yeah, they, they are amazing. Um, they're open 24 hours a day. They pick up fairly quickly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. reclaiming our voice, reclaiming our, yes. Yes, we are. All right. So I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for this. Um, I hope that I felt, a, I felt very alone during the process. And that's obviously what my abuser intended. I never want anyone else to feel alone. I want, I want her to know I want them to know that there are others who care about you, that you have a support system, that you are supported. And to believe in yourself, to believe in yourself. 100%. You got, you got this. this. You got that. And believe if you turn that page into that new chapter, there's an endless amount of possibilities. So that was one thing that I never mm -hmm. thought was real. I could get past that. I was stuck. But now that I see that there is that cheesy line, there's yes. that light at the end of the tunnel. Yes, ma'am. Yes, <laughs> there is. <laughs> right over there. Okay. All right. So next episode, we're going to dive a little bit deeper um, into, into this. So just October, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, send out love to anyone you know, or even those that you don't know, that you're not even aware of, that are going through something. Um, send love out to them and allow yourself to receive love from others as you go through this journey. So thank you, Joe. I appreciate you. I love you, girl. <laughs> and we'll be back with the next episode <laughs> very soon. Um, in the meantime, we will be posting links to the resources that we mentioned um, so that if you need help, you can find the help that you need. And uh, as always, 
so grateful and I want to leave leave everyone with some affirmations that have helped me throughout my journey and it's very simple you are enough you are loved you matter you are enough you are loved and you matter and you are supported so thank you thank you thank you all right y'all signing off bye